We'll start those at the bottom. Last chance of chipping out. Work your way up. See by leaving that, not cutting that from the top down, from the bottom up, that's why it's stronger there as you're working your way up. Reinforced. It's just American basswood then? Yeah, it's just basswood. This isn't a bad piece here. That one board is a little hard, man. This plank is really dense. Be great for like birds or something you really want some nice detail in. But for these more folky carvings, it's just a whole lot of work for no real gain. All it's gonna do is just work you. This little, when it's fuzzier like this, where the saw has been on it, because it's all rough sawn. And when it's fuzzy like this, it'll be softer. You see how this one's not fuzzy? And you can just feel that if you had these two blanks here, they're about the same size. You could feel the weight difference. This one's heavier, denser. This penguin was cut out of this piece of wood too. Had that kind of knot in it. I'm gonna leave that in a natural finish there. Had somebody that wanted one like that. And, but basswood is like cherry, it has a lot of density variations you can get. What do you look for in good carving basswood? Ideal carving basswood would be air dried, no kiln stuff, and just nice solid tree, you know, just nice solid wood. The harder, it's still not hard wood, it's just marginally harder than really nice soft basswood would be that's all it's not no basswood's gonna be hard hard you know it's not gonna be like oak or walnut or anything like that but it's there is noticeable differences in it and like i said when you get into like one of the planks i was working earlier this christmas was really really soft and it was great for this kind of carving, but I wouldn't have wanted to try to do anything really fragile or with a lot of detail necessarily out of it because it was the really, really loose basswood. Just really carved really nice, fast, but not very strong. And you kind of notice a, a color difference, how this is kind of a darker tan. And the softer basswood will tend to be that way, and the whiter basswood a lot of times tends to be the, the you just see how white that is. That typically denotes a harder basswood. Really white stuff. Some guys say the good basswood comes out of the north, you know, Wisconsin and Michigan. I don't know, I've cut, carved a lot of Indiana basswood and it seemed okay. So. Um, too too much into the regional argument about basswood, but I think it's more of a tree to tree thing. I could see the north woods maybe producing a little slower growing tree that maybe is a little more consistent or denser or something. If that's what you're after, but I'm not that much of a aficionado, I guess, on the material. I know what works for me and how I use the different types. If I was really being particular about something, had a particular type of carving going, I might look for some other traits. But these are pretty generic, so. And pretty simple carvings, there's not a lot to them. 
detail wise. These hat brims, I try to keep them strong because these are going to be decorative pieces in houses so you know they're going to get banged around a little. So in that vein, I try to get the edge of the hat, like out here you can kind of see where I got it pretty thin on that side from the saw. So now, and that's kind of the edge, very edge I'll go for, but I'll leave most of the brim actually fairly heavy just to keep somebody from accidentally breaking a carving. Try to make the stuff kind of durable that I know is going to be used kind of in that manner. I'd see it just even getting bumped, putting it in and out of a, you know, Christmas yeah. decorations box. Cat knocking it off a shelf, you know, something like that. Just, you don't want to make things too fragile that aren't, I mean, if it's something really nice, high-end piece, you know, bigger money, you know it's going to end up in a showcase somewhere, that's a little different than a piece that you figure is going to be a general decoration, it's going to get moved around, bumped around. Kids, cats, dogs, you know, those things you kind of want to, I like to try to make those carvings a little more durable than I would maybe a more run-of-the-mill piece that... And even though I'm just using eight quarter wood here, by cutting out my pattern, leaving like this scarf hanging out here, I try to get more of a three dimensional effect out of that size wood that I'm actually utilizing. Kind of, kind of cheating the system a little bit and trying to do things I. Not really, most of my carvings like these, I don't really use very many tools. Um, I mean, kind of what's right here close to me is pretty much what I use. Uh, and I don't really use all these on any one carving, but these are kind of the tools to do these kind of folky type Christmas carvings. Main thing is decent tools and keep them real sharp. The sharpness is probably the single biggest factor in all this being able to do the work consistently and get the outcome that you're wanting. The more you carve, the more you get. Uh, you know, good image in your head of where you're going at the end. So you can take off more wood earlier because you know where you're going. So you're more confident in, your, in the three-dimensional concept of what you're working on and you know, go through it because you know where you're going.
see this piece of wood's got a little bit of grain running into it. But just getting your kind of your image or your outline in, like if you were doing painting, you'd be doing your layout, and that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm just kind of going along here and kind of getting things where I want them. And Really got a running in grain going there that's just being kind of a headache to work with. Okay. You want to protect the detail above there just making that stop cut you can keep yourself from risking a chip out i can go through there with my v tool as well and protect it but when i'm at this stage in the carving i'm just kind of working with the tool i have in my hand This big flat, it's a five 50 millimeter or 20 millimeter wide, five millimeter or five number five sweep. And uh, real handy, real handy tool. You use it for doing all kinds of things. This type of carving. I like these tools, Swiss made. They don't pay me in any way, but I like Swiss made tools. They're, they're some of the best tools. The only thing I'll say about them is that the way they come from the factory, they're set up to carve soft wood. They have a real low angle out here on their sharpening angle, their bevel. And you get even into a knot or something in basswood, and you can roll an edge. Um, the steel's not extremely hard. They won't chip easily, but you can roll an edge on them. I have. Every now and then I'll have to fix an edge when I mess it up. Really nice tools to work with. They hold an edge well. I like the handle shape. But I think they're just really nice tools. Cost more than some tools, but in tools, buy it once, buy a good tool, and use it for your whole life. And <clears throat> you'll never regret it. You aren't going to wear a set of these out. How long have you had these? Um, most of these. I, I've probably had, I don't know, 20 some years now. Um, I kind of moved into them. I started out with a cheaper set of tools and I still have that cheaper set of tools and they were okay. They just weren't, uh, they didn't sharpen as nice. They didn't hold an edge quite as well. Um, they were actually German made. Um, I don't know if these are actually made in Switzerland or made in Germany or Austria, but, uh, and they were okay. They were just a lower, great of finish and things and I still have them um, 
bought them from a company now that's long defunct out of Ohio. Uh, like it was like Latung Woodworking or something. They had a little catalog they sent out. And I remember getting that set of tools. I was probably, I bought those when I was 20 or so. And uh, first real set of chisels I'd ever had. It pretty much been a, just a knife carver before that. And a few old chisels I'd found here and there and ground and modified and things. But back then, the 70s and early 80s, there just wasn't, you didn't have access to things you have access to now, tool-wise and information and stuff. It just wasn't there. Now you can source anything and have it in a week. But that's not how the world was. At this stage, you don't want to get too caught up in details. I'm just kind of going through and really setting the field here for what I want. But not getting too crazy with it yet. Just want to keep things nice and clean, cuts nice and sharp. Start getting things kind of the way you want them. It's basically the same thing I did on the front. Sometimes I do all this roughing at once and then go through and do what I just did. And sometimes I don't. It's just kind of whatever mood I'm in. I'm going to knock these corners off right now because they're hard on my hands. I've been carving about every day now for a few weeks and it's, things are getting a little touchy. This is always a really busy time of year for carving and I never get far enough ahead of the Christmas rush. My hands are getting pretty beat up. You don't have to get everything right to your line. That's not the point of this. The point of this is getting wood out of your way that you don't need. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just... And I don't want to work this this way because of that hat brim. I don't want to chip that off. So I'm going to work this all across the grain. That's where the sharp tools come in. That's where the sharp tools really come in, yeah. Again, even like this carving, you could do this carving entirely with just a knife. Uh, take you longer, but as far as can it be done that way? Oh yeah, it could be knife carved. I like just sitting down knife carving sometimes, just whittling on things, and it's just kind of nice and relaxing. And almost kind of production carving here. Knocking the stuff out. Not where he's going to have the scarf there around his neck and I'm kind of leaving that. Now I'm down below the hat and kind of got a little bit of a piece there where the scarf's going to go. So now I can start working with that grain a little bit, making a little faster progress. Of working across it. And this is longer than it's going to be. I kind of leave that there as a, a stop area just to get abused uh, that I don't have to worry about. And I'm still being careful here. I'm tucking that arm in against my body using my body to push more than my arm so I have better control of it. And then I got my other hand there kind of as a stop so that I can't just go up here and cut his head off or something by accident. So just kind of want to take your time so that you don't have to fix something later. Glue something back on, wait on it, 
How many carvings have you done this year? Uh, here in the last few weeks, I think I've done about 60. Not a lot, but you know, several. A lot of time if I can do that and get that nice long sliver there. I put that in my little box of slivers. And that make noses out of that for snowmen and things. It's just a, I just keep, a, if I get a nice long split like that, you know the grain's running right through that because you split it off. And uh, it's nice and strong, makes nice nose material and things for sand, or for snowmen. We'll need a nose for this guy, so. The back of it's pretty boring here. It's just some long strokes and just after a nice carved finish back here, basically. So you can work this area pretty much to finish right off the bat. Not a lot of detail in it. So there's scarf that's gonna stick out here. We'll just kind of start working our way around that. Carving's a lot like every other form of art. It's part real and part illusion. I mean, the goal is to get the end viewer to take the details you do put in and in a sense they'll see more than is there if you're good at your craft. You know, a night do a nice carving and with enough detail but not too much to make it too difficult to manage it. See right here, the grain's running up at me and it's trying to catch and tear out, so. Kind of get close to where I want to be. And then I'm going to have to probably work some of this backwards to get what I want. Like I say, on the bulk of the snowman, what I'm after is just a really nice finish. And again, here where I got this scarf sticking out, goes back to that question of fragility. And I want a nice 3D effect there, but I don't want to make it too fragile. So I'm not going to make it down like it's a piece of cloth. Like if I was doing like a fine art type carving, it's going to be more of a, it's going to be left a little heavier. So I don't run into any, making it too fragile and it gets broken. I send the carving back and I have to try and fix the thing. Which I fixed a lot of carvings over the years. <laughs> a lot of my carvings have come back and I've learned a lot on how I carve because of just that stuff coming back and you say, ah, that wasn't a good idea, was it? And like I said, if it's a carving going more in a fine art setting where you know it's gonna end up in a cabinet somewhere, it's different than a carving like this that's kind of general decoration. And see, we can kind of set that, start setting that line for that hat. And then we're leaving that bill pretty heavy. We'll take this up some, but uh, we'll leave a, a good amount of, of wood there just to make sure everything's safe, secure, and strong. These carvings are kind of a compromise between detail and practicality. Kind of now setting the hat brim. That's kind of where I want it. Going around 
here. Knock some of that corner off. And I use my tools both ways. It just kind of depends on what I'm doing. It's got to be pay attention that that bevel is going to grab more if you turn that tool over. I kind of know where you're going with it. Key is just not to get yourself worked into real small corners and things. Carvings like this, it's just gonna make you work harder for no real gain. The outcome of the carving. Keep things open enough you can get to them with your tools. I just kind of come down here and kind of get the line of my tree established. Pull that top back just a little, give the tree just a little more lean into him. Now I'm going to go back where I had that buffer there. I'm going to start taking that off because I'm down. I'm not moving big amounts of wood anymore. I'm down to things getting kind of closer to where I want them. here just being gentle so I don't chip this corner out I should undercut that first but I do this a lot and, and kind of feel if that woods gonna take that or not and it's felt pretty good so I just went ahead and did it the easy way kind of break all my edges like down around the bottom there just get that on there and then I don't have to worry about things chipping later or being sharp wouldn't hurt to shorten my block here just a little some smaller carvings I could get in there a little more
Again, you just want nice, sharp, clean tools so you don't leave, you know, little drag marks from a chip or something in your part. You just want to try to keep it kind of nice. She's getting down here kind of towards the end. You know, we want to start making things nice. You can feel that curl right there. It's kind of weird to have curly basswood, but that's what I've got going on here. It's probably near the bottom of the tree or near a fork in the tree and the tree had stress from wind and things and so it stacked its grain up and kind of start establishing the scarf around his neck a little bit take this out just a little bit I don't really finish these in any particular order. Um, it's kind of a top-down thing in a sense on a lot of them for me. Um, especially if the carving is going to get more fragile from what I'm going to take away down here, then I definitely would work in a top-down. Uh, this carving isn't as crucial that way. So... Yeah, the V-tool, Vayner, whatever you want to call it, it's kind of large, but um, I can do little things with a large tool, but you can't really do large things with a little tool. And so this gets in about everywhere I need to get in on a carving. And if it's a tighter space than that, I'll either use my knife or I'll use my skew, uh, typically to get into a tighter location than what the V-tool would allow me into. Um, My tool selection's kind of geared more towards a almost a minimalistic approach of number of tools required than anything else. Got that hat still just a little low in the back. I wanted to give it a little sense of tilt, but I don't want too much tilt in it. So I'm gonna practically roll that out. Let's see here a second. Okay, so right now I'm going to kind of leave that scarf, kind of work my way around this hat, kind of try to get it in the head, start kind of getting it about finished up. Like everything else that you work on, 
you kind of start out with big broad strokes if you're painting and big sweeping lines if you're drawing and then you start working down ever smaller. That's the same way in carving. You start out with big cuts and flaking pieces off and things and then you just keep coming down to smaller and smaller cuts. Getting closer and closer to the finish line. Like right here, I'm kind of cutting against the grain and things. And that's where that sharp tool thing just keeps coming back. Keep your tool sharp. You'll have a lot more success than you will if you're with all tools and you're trying to cut straight across the end grain and everything's carrying on it'll you won't have a real good time i'm kind of cutting right into the stem of the hat there that's okay because it's going to have a ribbon around it band hat band around it so i just kind of give me a denotation line there that i'll clean up with my v tool here in a minute And kind of even in your coarse carving there, if you know you're going to have like a hat band, I'll start to kind of get a little bit of a waste defined in there with my gouge before I even hit it with a V-tool. Just to kind of get wood out of the way and make everything fit together nice. Kind of like it when things go together well. Even if I know the carbon is going to be painted, I still like to give it a, a nice cut finish from the tool. Um, not have any sawn surfaces or anything left on it. So it's kind of your job to make a nice looking piece. And that's kind of what I'm doing here is just cleaning up some surfaces and things ready. Helps if you get a little bit ambidextrous to where you can switch hands and work to yourself or away from yourself. Okay, I'm going to put the hat band on there, and uh, the surface over here needs a little work. Got a better brim line kind of going. I'm just going to kind of finish up the top of the hat, 
and then I'll start kind of coming down the carving and You can even, when you're doing little details like this, you can leave your carving pretty loose and just kind of lean on it and it'll hold it. If you're working off a carving bench screw like I am right now. The biggest thing is if you keep rotating it the one direction, it keeps tightening back up. That's, a, that's the bigger headache with it. And see, I didn't quite match up over here, but we'll just kind of blend everybody together. Okay. This is where you kind of get down to your your last cuts, making things look nice. There's a good chance I won't come back up on here. Um, let me finish things up. this up a little more. So kind of what I'm after now is just kind of getting a consistent uh, brim width, so to speak. Kind of getting that. And that, it's fairly heavy. Um, I'm going to have to come in here now and start establishing his head. Um, if you were doing a really fine carving, you know, you get thin sections down where you start to see light through them, but that's not the kind of carving we're doing today. Just enough natural light today. Ideally, just a little more light would be really nice. But I could turn on my shop lights, but they kill your depth perception. And I like working from natural directional light, and I can set up directional light in here. But if I can get by with what comes in the window, that's what I prefer. I always like to work at natural light for carving. Well, really any art, but I just think it's I think it's better and I think it gives you a better end product. But it's just me. So we're gonna kind of start establishing.
See, I just can't get in there now with that. I'm kind of the game's over for my big tool in here. So I got this little fish tail. And I have a couple of these. This one's really flat, as you can see. It's a 3F and 12 wide. And then this guy here is a 7F and an 8 wide. Uh, both really handy. Fishtails are really handy for getting in areas that you don't have good access. And that's really all you want to use them for because you can use them up pretty fast sharpening them. But they're real handy for tight spaces and a light touch. It's just really hard to beat a fishtail to get in places and, and do things and just get surfaces and things just the way you want them. And then again, it kind of goes back to that. Using those tools, whatever way you need to, to get what you want. So as we work our way around here. Some of this may have to resort just to my knife to get in there. Because Ben's, it's a snowman, it's a fairly smooth face. And I kind of want to keep that going there, that smoothness. So I got to have a pretty flat blade in there. So you're kind of down to a skew or a knife. particular case knife's working okay Again, you want real sharp direct cuts. You want to get what you want with as few passes as possible. You don't want a furry fuzzy carving. You want a nice clean concise carving. Getting this face cleaned up takes a little bit of work because there's some facets and things there. I got a little bump there I don't like. Because again, a snowman so I kind of got to keep that round head persona going. I see over here I still got a little bit of an issue but kind of work our way through it. You're just killing my light man. Me? <laughs> yeah there right there. Oh. That's fine right there. See that difference? Yeah I did I didn't even. It just it's huge. huge. That's so weird because I am facing the sun. Yeah, but that window. But that window is bouncing enough light in. That's a so we're this west. window here is what we needed. Yeah, facing west. That window is a west-facing window, but it makes a huge difference of bringing light in here, so I can see down into these nooks and crannies as I'm working my way around this head. You almost need like some kind of a solarium, you know, where you're just out and you have light from all directions, but. Like I said, I have good lights over the bench and things that, but they really flatten work out. And when you're doing three dimensional work, really good lights, not what you want. You want really directional light so you can see what you're doing. To give that depth, that sense of depth to everything is what you really need. See, I levered my knife blade into that and just chipped my hat brim there. Didn't even catch it. 
there just that little bit of pressure and that narrowness of that blade just nicked that just boom that quick and then you get to go fix that and you can see little nicks there i'll clean those up here in a minute but And you do that all the time in your carving with a knife. You always are levering it off of something to get cuts here, get cuts there off your thumb or off the carving. The thing the knife doesn't give you, it just doesn't give you the control that the chisel gives you. Because the chisel, you have two hands on it, so you always have that. That nicer control. Again, just kind of rounding that up nice. I think I've got that kind of the way I want it. Again, that grain is still trying to go in up here. And I've got to be real cautious because there's no extra wood here. So when I start getting into a situation like that, your friend is across the cut across the grain. If your wood's getting funky with the grain, then just quit and go across the grain. Take the wood's ability to mess you up away. Just switch it up, go a different way. And when you're carving in, in three dimensional carvings like this, so what we're doing right now is this right here where we're going to get this layering effect of this scarf. So this outer piece goes over the tie around his neck, just as you tie your scarf. This one comes from underneath. So you want to work that top end. So you're going to work your way into that carving. So I'm going to establish the upper layer first. <clears throat> you can get to, just to define this so everybody can see it. But my upper layer is right here. And so that's the upper layer of the scarf. And then the, this is going to come in next, tie around the neck. And then the bottom layer is going to come out of there. This one's a little tighter than this one. But it's going to come out of here. And it's going to come down along the tree. Here's how we're going to push it over here to the side. And I may actually, because we're a little tighter, I think I'm going to put, just let it run into the tree. And that just saves me from white, red, three levels, I can only have to deal with two levels. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna run the scarf into the tree here and bring this over a little bit and that'll be my scarf. This line won't exist and I'll have everything I want. So I know my wood's a little funky right here and I don't like the way that felt. So I'm gonna go at this the other direction. And this thing's really sharp or I would probably be outlining this with a knife, but this tool's really sharp. I keep it that way just because of things like this. So I'm gonna establish the upper layer of my scarf. And while I'm over here, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this in. Turn my tool around. Now I'm shaving myself. But get that in. And then again, because this tool's big, I can lay it down. I can use it kind of as a flat. Just kind of knock this down in here. And then I can come in and actually make the next cut as well. Up into there. Kind of establish that treetop right there. So now, this side of my scarf is pretty well established. A little cleanup work. And those little tiny details of having nice crisp corners. Uh, there was a carver from a, very early in my lifetime that I knew. I think he still carves rock blosser. He learned a very uh, Swiss form of carving faces in um, basically the resinous pine knots that are left in a forest after the trees rot away. And he always reiterated down <laughs> turkeys. So oh, wow. Whenever we would talk, we would t uh, about 
uh, the importance of the crispness of your carving. That's having those those details and those corners being deep and sharp. And it just lends, those tiny little details lend a real credibility to your carving sense of depth. And if I'm up there like that, where I, I don't want to push on that, if something happen, bad happens, I'm going to cut right across that. So I'll tap it in just to heal my hand there a little bit. Uh, I don't do a lot of that. It's hard on your hands, but if it's just a little deal like that, it's okay. it won't hurt you. Won't do lasting damage and give you carpal tunnel or anything. goal here just to undercut that enough give it a sense of depth but not really weaken it
Okie dokie. I'll go around and do the base first. People don't really see that, but it's nice if it's textured. Okay, now go ahead and do And it's weird, but you can feel in both here when your tool gets dull. I mean, you'll you'll just know it's not that whoosh anymore. It's a, it just has a a lower tone to it as the tool gets dull. It's really weird. key to these is figuring out just how much detail it takes to, you know, it's like anything else in art, to make it what you want it to be. It's like that, that's still really strong, but it gives it a nice, you look at it and it's got a nice broken look. Looks really nice. That's what I like. Getting it to where it has the look I want without risking it. Probably this is pesky wood with that grain up in here. Just 
just wants to peel out so bad. You can just tell when you stick that chisel in there if that's going to try to split out. It's all it takes. It's just that. Just think I enter just pushing on it. And you can go, eh, it's not going to do what I want it to do. Tells you best be going the other direction. I'm just kind of going over and looking at things and getting everything the way I really want it. Even enough the brim of his hat a little. I'm not after stuff being perfect, perfect, but I want it the way I want it. minimize my fuzzies and I put a nose on him and I think we're done. I think the other one has a smile. Oh, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Smile is a very touchy thing to get. But you got to push hard enough to cut, but you don't want it to run up to his nose, up to his ear, or something, you know. Have a little situation on your hands. Got our high tech power tool. Take a piece of wood. Yeah. 
nose is kind of like everything else. You want to get it thin enough to look good, but you don't want it just to be, you know, look at it and break it fragile. So I try to taper them so that they're only really thin out towards the end. Need to make up and sell replacement noses. Yeah, I probably should have replacement noses on hand at all times. Probably should ship a replacement nose with each carving. What I usually do is just kind of take off that really pointed end because it's really fragile. Okay, so what I do is I pull that guy out, put it aside. There's a little spot there I want to hit. Just a little too flat up there. Didn't look quite right. There's just a little right there, that fuzziness in there. I just don't like that. I like that nice, sharp corner that, that just gives that depth when you get that nice little bit of darkness there just gives it depth okay so now we'll take him off Just kind of check the bottom, make sure it's nice and clean. There we go. Yeah. Another snowman. <laughs>